Thanks go out to the committee to organise these weekends for us because they're very important. We live in turbulent times and for us to enjoy the fellowship together and to come around the things that count I think is critical, it's important and we want to receive that encouragement and to enliven our vision as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I think more than ever before the events that are happening in the world today are having global repercussions and those events uh, put unprecedented pressure uh, on the governments and the authorities of this world to find a solution and of course we know that no real solution is being found. And so in recent weeks of course you'd be fully aware the world is still reeling from the events that happened in U Ukraine, Malaysian Airlines, MH17. There's a frustration uh, from Australia's viewpoint as to try and seek some resolution for their investigation and of course that's not happening. Uh, right through the Middle East over the last couple of weeks we would again be aware of the anguish and the agony that's happening in the Middle East as Gaza, the Palestinians and Israel uh, try to, to uh, defend one another and uh, form up their own barriers and of course again the world's eyes are on the Middle East again which we know will be an indicator of the return of Jesus Christ. Those solutions are very difficult to come by. Uh, in the religious sphere as well just in recent times, you'd be aware the Church of England has ordained women for the first time to be bishops. And of course, uh, that's overturned centuries of tradition. So there's a massive shift in the religious world as far as their structure and their hierarchy are concerned. And again, in the social sphere, massive changes as well. Uh, people who are living alternative lifestyles, uh, now that's been mandated and made law and accepted by society. So wherever we look, politically, religiously, socially, there's massive changes moving in our world. But we're not here to solve world problems tonight, are we? And we know that that won't happen until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Why are we here tonight? Well, we're here to get together as a community and to enjoy the fellowship that we do, to celebrate that and to endeavour to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so I think the um, subject that we have over the weekend will be helpful and valuable to us all. We're talking about fellowship, we're talking about refocusing our vision on the Lord Jesus Christ particularly. And it is a, a, an important subject when we think about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it impacts us in 2014. Because again we live in an electronic age where we are bombarded with electronic devices and many of us grapple with trying to adjust to all this technology and so we have all this uh, extra paraphernalia and apps that now we can, we can access, you know, FaceTime and Facebook and we can upload stuff into the cloud and some of us struggle with where all this is going. And with our subject tonight, I think one of the, the critical factors is we want to tap into our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. How deep is that relationship? Is it active? It is, is it lively? It is, re is it real? Because I think technology inhibits that. And one comment that I thought was quite appropriate was made recently and, and the gentleman said the more technology improves, the more we are losing the skills of deep personal and meaningful communication. So of course we can send SMSs to each other, we can keep in touch through Facebook and we can send emails to one another. And that's nice and that's good, particularly if you live in the other side of the world. But the reality is how deep are those relationships? And are we able to deal with some of the issues of life simply by sending someone an SMS and saying, well, I'm thinking of you, and then 10 seconds later another SMS saying, I'm going to have a cup of coffee. So, you know, it, it, it sometimes illustrates the shallowness of that particular medium. So there is, I think, in the generations that are emerging, a difficulty to deal with relational issues. And that is because technology is inhibiting that. We've become used to uh, chatting to machines and uh, sending electronic messages and really the depth of those relationships aren't always fully explored. Uh, I think one of the early times that I had an experience of that was some years ago uh, when I was in my position at work I was just following up on an invoice that hadn't been paid. I, I phoned up a company, I, don't, I won't tell you the name of the company because it doesn't really matter but uh, I phoned up the company, I talked to the girl and I said, look, um, I've got an invoice that's unpaid, can I speak to someone in the accounts department? 
Well, next minute, uh, the voice said, oh, hi, we've got uh, some specials on this week, wondering if you'd be interested. And I said, well, no, I'm not really interested in that. I'm just calling in work to follow up on an invoice. And then the voice said, well, we've got some really good specials on. Uh, as far as home handyware is concerned, and just uh, wondering whether you'd you know, like to view our catalogue. So I said, no, not really. And then it went on to, to outline the specials. And then the next minute, the girl came back on the line and said, I'll just put you through now to the manager. And I'd realised I'd just been talking to an answering machine for the last two minutes or so. Like they just had spaces in between the statements and I thought I was talking to the girl on the reception. I was actually talking to an answering machine, machine so I was quite embarrassed about that. But that's you know, the world in which we live in, isn't it? We're talking to electronic devices half the time, we don't know about it. So what we want to explore tonight is a little bit deeper than that. It's to come to an appreciation, a realisation of what Christ has done for us, what he did for other people, and how we can reach out and enhance and develop and deepen the relationship that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ through prayer to the Father. So it was the Apostle John, I think he said a very wonderful statement, it was 2,000 years ago, and in his epistle he said this, I've got many things to write unto you, but I don't want to do it with paper and ink, but I trust that I'll come unto you and speak to you face to face that our joy might be full. Now I guess paper and ink was probably a modern invention back in the time of the Apostle John. But he really realised that he didn't want to communicate the preciousness of this message just on paper and ink, but he wanted to speak to people face to face. So John understood the importance of physical contact and touch. And again in his epistle he wrote about his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know how important that was to John, because remember it says that he leant on the breast of Jesus Christ in the upper room. So there was physical contact in which John was able to deepen and enliven that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote in his first epistle, he said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. So for John, an association with the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just something mechanical, it was something that was deep and meaningful. And that's where the thrust of our weekend is going to go. We want to particularly talk about this aspect of human touch. And we want to see in the events uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ how he felt compelled to reach out and to touch people. And why is that? Well, it's because one of the senses that we have, the sense of touch, is really critical to our existence. So, for example, scientists tell us that a baby who is developing in the mother's womb is already sensitive to touch long before it can see and hear. So that sense has already been enlivened before the baby can see and hear. Another comment says, humans can survive without vision, hearing or smell. There are some senses that we can survive with that are not, well, they're important to us, but we can still survive. But the comment goes on, but not without touch. And there are people that have a particular disease called cutaneous allagia, uh, in which that sense is not enlivened. And I was listening to a radio report the other day and said many of these people don't survive beyond their third year because they can put their hand on hot objects and not realise they're doing extensive damage because their senses are just not there. Uh, so in relation to this, a number of experiments have been done going right back to 1945. Again, a, a particularly uh, remarkable experiment was conducted in which orphan babies were, were dying at a fairly rapid rate. And there was an investigation that happened and they found that one of the reasons for that is because these babies weren't being cuddled and hugged and touched. They were just orphans uh, and they were left to fend for themselves. So the mortality rate was quite high. So there's been a number of experiments that have shown that as a baby and as a young child develops, they need that attribute of physical touch. And again, there are some quite startling statistics there that are a result of non-human contact. So studies in 75, 86, and further studies have shown that there is a decrease in depression, anxiety, and stress levels in children who have that wonderful connection with their parents or with relatives in which they are hugged and embraced and they feel that contact. So physical contact, physical touch is more than just skin deep and there are over five million touch receptors in our skin. So just uh, in, our, in our fingers itself, in the fingertip, there's 3,000 touch receptors. 
So these are very sensitive to touch. So our hands, of course, uh, we can become skillful surgeons, uh, guiding uh, a cutting out of a cancer or a tumour, or we can be bricklayers, we can be pianists, or we can be artists, because our hands have this amazing capability of sensitivity, and that's inbuilt into our bodies by our father. It can reduce our heart rate. You touch a person, you shake a person's hand, it can reduce their heart rate and lower uh, blood pressure. So it actually has some physical results. This comment is appropriate, though. Above all the communicative behaviours, touch is the most immediate, the most intimate and the most commanding because it is so closely tied to our own personal identity. So when someone reaches out and hugs that, that is the transfer of affection to us and we feel that and that's encouraging and important to us. And so this is the process that our Lord Jesus Christ showed in his ministry as he reached out and touched people. And in the miracles that we're going to have a look at over our, our weekend, God willing, these are miracles in which there was no need for Christ to reach out and contact people. He could have just snapped his fingers and it would have happened. But he felt compelled because he wanted to connect and show reassurance to that particular person, reach out and touch them. And so we're going to explore that uh, over the weekend. So we have a number of aims, three aims. First of all, we want to become more aware of our own individual need for Jesus Christ. These were people who had problems and issues in their lives and they reached out and they connected to Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we go through life and we really don't analyse where we're at in our connection to the Father. We just float along with everyone else. Maybe, brothers and sisters and young people, this is a wake-up call for, yeah, well, let's actually examine our connection to Christ. How close are we? Is it a living, vibrant connection? Or are we just comfortable to sit on chairs and turn up once a week on a Sunday morning and then just get involved in the routine of every life, everyday life? So that's one of our aims. Uh, secondly, to recognise that life's pressures are designed to develop our relationship with the Father. There are things that happen in our lives, there are handicaps, there are impediments that happen to us, whether that's emotional, spiritual, uh, whatever it is, physical, that happen in our lives that are designed to, to, to help us reconnect with the Father. And sometimes we, we don't explore where that pressure should be taking us. And thirdly, we want to achieve a greater closeness to the Father and our brothers and sisters by reaching out and appreciating the work and the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So each of us have a different spectrum of needs. And I've said it might be physical, it might be moral, it might be emotional, it could be a combination of all of those things. But often as we continue in the truth over some years, there's a sense of disconnection, isn't there? Because sometimes the truth can become monotonous. We come every Sunday, we come every Wednesday, we meet the same people. And sometimes there is a disconnection process that happens that maybe we aren't aware of. And we need to drill down a little bit further and open up some of these events and parallel our own lives and see where we're at in our relationship with the Father. We often open our Bibles at a study week and we, we discover the beautiful uh, technical aspects of the Bible. But how does that affect us in real life? So we need to develop a passion for our Lord Jesus Christ and for our Father. And it was the Apostle Paul, I think, he put in very beautiful terms when he's talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, and so will we ever be with the Lord. Well, what did Paul mean by that? He was aspiring to be with Jesus Christ. Is that where we sit, brothers and sisters? 2014, are we comfortable with our world now? Or are we looking, to be forward, looking forward to being with our Lord Jesus Christ? Because that was Paul's aspiration and it needs to be ours. So as far as our Lord Jesus Christ is concerned, in his ministry he had an extreme sensitivity to people's needs. There's a whole range of characters who, who came and they reached out and they touched Jesus Christ with a desperateness because they wanted to contact, they wanted his healing, they wanted his reassurance and they reached out and they touched the Lord Jesus Christ and he couldn't help but be compelled to reach out and touch them as well because that was inside him, that was his sensitivity. When a leper confronted the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't recall in horror and say, step back from me. He reached down and he embraced that man and he healed that man. 
He couldn't help but touch them. He had a desire for that human contact. And when we look at the Gospels, it's quite surprising to see the number of occasions the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to reach out and give that physical reassurance to people. So the man with leprosy says, Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. Didn't have to, could have just snapped his fingers or could have just said, be healed. But within the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that was amazing sensitivity that he wanted to touch that man. He wanted to give him that reassurance. And so we go on. Peter's mother-in-law, he touched her, healed her, the woman with the issue, uh, two blind men. We go through the record. There were people who wanted to touch the Lord Jesus Christ. A uh, woman in the house of Simon, Peter on the sea. Jesus stretched forth his hand and helped Peter out of that, uh, the Lake of Gal Galilee. People of Gennesaret. Again, deaf, blind, other disciples. It's quite surprising as we go through the gospel record and we start to recount the numerous occasions where the Lord Jesus Christ reached out to contact people. And there's a reason for it. See, when we look at this, this quotation in Mark chapter 7, the context is this. It says, They bring unto him one that was deaf, and he had an impediment in his speech, and they besought him to put his hand upon him. Well, what did Jesus do? He says he took him aside from the multitude, took him away. You know, th this wasn't just a public uh, facade that the Lord was creating. He took him aside privately and he put his fingers on his ears and he spit and he touched the man's tongue because he couldn't talk very well. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was giving the man that reassurance that he was healing his hearing and his speech as well. Again, with the blind man, the record says he took the blind man by the hand and took him out of the town. Again, this wasn't just play acting by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to get the public behind him. He led him out of the town. It says when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him and then asked if he saw aught. The man look, looked up and said, I see some vague shadows. Jesus put his hands again on him, on his eyes, and made him look up. Now, it's interesting there that it says he spit on his eyes. And you think, what, 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 what was that all about? And I never knew till a few years ago. Uh, I went to Florida. There's a, a little place that you can visit. I think it's called Bible Lands or something or other. It's, you can go in there and everyone's dressed up as they were 2,000 years ago and there's some talks. They've got a big display of the, the city of Jerusalem uh, back in the top times of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a professor of archaeology who was there and he's, he was sort of pointing out the geographical uh, locations of different events in Jerusalem and on the side he made this interesting comment he said back in the days of Jesus uh, there was a rabbinical tradition that when Messiah would come his teaching would be so profound that even if he was talking and some spit came off his lip and dropped on someone it would have a healing impact and he said that's why in the in the in the lessons here Jesus sometimes would spit on his hands and he would heal a particular person. I thought, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Now I can actually read that verse and understand that it was a tradition uh, amongst them that this, the Messiah would have such healing power. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was tapping into that as he touched and reached out for people. Well, that relates to people 2,000 years ago. What about to us, brothers and sisters? And Paul lifts out this very wonderful point, doesn't he, in the book of Hebrews. He says, we don't have a high priest who is unaffected by our problems and our difficulties, one who cannot be touched, and the Greek word is sympathia, which obviously our English word sympathy or empathy or compassion. He says he understands the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So we can come before the throne of grace boldly to obtain mercy and help in time of need because Jesus understands our lives more than sometimes we understand ourselves. So it is relevant to us. And so here's the pathway we're going to take over the weekend. Tonight we're going to have a look at, well, there's a problem of old age, which we all face. I mean, we might be young, but, you know, blink your eyelids and a few years go by and, well, hair starts to go grey and fall out and other things happen as well. But we all get old. Uh, and so in this particular event, people who were reaching out for Jesus Christ, this is the first couple who reached out for Jesus Christ when he was a baby. They wanted to hold him because he gave to them a lot of consolation. So that's our study tonight. And tomorrow, uh, a woman who had an emotional need. Uh, the sinner woman. 
she came in and again she wanted to touch the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very difficult circumstance in the Pharisee's house. Third study, physical need. Woman who had an issue for 12 years. No one could give her any solution. Jesus did. So she had a physical need and the result was she was healed and she respected Christ as the great physician. A moral need as far as uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Members of the Sanhedrin didn't quite understand what Jesus was all about. But at the cross there, they reached out for the body of Christ. It had been crucified, it was a dead body, but they made contact and they cared for the body of Jesus Christ. They identified him as the true Messiah. And our fifth, fifth one, uh, the problem of faithlessness and perplexity and change in life, which we all have to deal with. Uh, we're going to look at Mary and Thomas and how both of these uh, worked their way through the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ Thomas particularly wanted to reach out, remember he wanted to reach out and touch the side of Jesus Christ. So that's the plan for uh, our weekend and we're going to have a look at Simeon and Anna. So these were the first couple who reached out for the Lord Jesus Christ, just 40 days after the birth of Christ and uh, this was long before Jesus had begun his ministry in the temple. And I think it's relevant that we begin our studies with a focus on older brothers and sisters uh, because sometimes as young people, young families, as we're growing up, we're very focused on ourselves, our own needs, and we forget sometimes our older brothers and sisters in the ecclesia, we forget to reach out to them and provide and give them encouragement and strength because, well, they've always been there. Sometimes we don't show our gratitude to older brothers and sisters who have borne a lot of pressure and have remained consistent over many, many years. And the exhortation they provide to us is consistency and loyalty. And we'll see it in these two wonderful individuals. So as far as the, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned, well, this would have been an amazing event for Simeon. He'd been waiting for a lifetime for this event. And remember, it was revealed to him that he would not die until he'd seen the Lord's Christ. So you can imagine him here standing in the temple waiting, and he sees this couple come in. And it's revealed to him by the Spirit that this is Messiah. And for him, what a tremendous moment as an old person to have this consolation of, of coming into contact with God's saving grace. So you can just imagine that moment, can't you? Because for many, many, many years, Simeon had been waiting to see the Lord's Christ. And as he came into the temple there, that would have been a wonderful reassurance because there was a physical problem. This man was going to die. He was mortal. But he was able to look beyond that mortality to the comfort and the solution that the Lord Jesus Christ would provide. So here in Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, Luke records, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. So as far as this man was concerned, uh, in verse 25, it just says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Well, he wasn't just standing around in a passive sense, in a bored sense, and saying, well, I wonder when this is all going to happen. You know, I'm a lot older than what I thought I was going to be. How, how long is this going to take? It wasn't just a matter of waiting. He was expecting and anticipating. Diaglot says, a righteous and a pious man expecting the consolation of Israel as the Greek word prostikomeo, and it means to look for in, with a view of favourable reception. Vine says to receive to oneself. Same word is used in Titus 2 and verse 13 where it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. So the question is for ourselves. If Simeon was in the temple expecting and waiting in anticipation for the return of, well, not the return of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, what about ourselves, brothers and sisters? In what sense are we waiting? Have we lost faith, lost a bit of courage, lost a bit of fortitude? Journey's been a bit longer than what we thought it was going to be? Or do we still have that anticipation and expectation? Because that's where Simeon was. It wasn't passive, it wasn't boring. It was an active anticipation and a keenness to welcome the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's interesting is that particular word, prostikomeo, is only used in two situations. This one here in the temple here in verse 25, also in verse 38 it's the word looked when we, we read about Anna, she's speaking to all those who are looking, who are in anticipation and then we jump a huge leap of 35 years through to Joseph of Arimathea who it says waited for the kingdom of God, 
It's not the word waited, it's the word expected. So here, the book ends of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was Simeon and Anna, and at the end, there was Joseph of Arimathea. These were people who were expecting and waiting and anticipating the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they had a common thread and an understanding of what Messiah's purpose is all about. Because when you listen to Simeon's words of, well, she'll be saying encouragement to, to Mary, they were surprising words, weren't they? Because Simeon particularly understood what the sacrifice of Christ was all about. So you notice again in our record here it says, the Holy Spirit was upon him, verse 26. It was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And again in verse 27, he came by the Spirit. So there was a strong urgency that drove this man into the temple at this particular time. He was anticipating and he was allowing the spirit of God, i.e. God's word, to have an influence upon his mind, to motivate him, to encourage him, to enthuse him. He could have said, well, I'm too old, I'm too weary. But he allowed the word of God, the spirit of God, to drive him and to keep him active and enthusiastic. Because when he saw Jesus Christ, you know, that was a, that was a signal that his, that his life was going to come to an end. Really, wasn't it? You won't see death until you see the Lord's Christ. And if it was us, we'd probably be wanting to put off the event, wouldn't we? Because there's a time marker there. Once you see Messiah, well then, that would be the end of your life. But this man couldn't wait to see the Messiah being revealed because... The Messiah held the key to unending joy and unending life. And although mortality was affecting him in old age, nevertheless, he had that wonderful vision. Well, the opposite to that is 2 Peter 3 and verse 4, which says, there'll be scoffers in the last day saying, where's the promise of his coming? You know, years have rolled by. I was saying this back in 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000. Where's the promise of his coming? And Peter says, you know what, brothers and sisters, we have to be very aware that that attitude doesn't affect us, that we just become passive seat warmers in our ecclesias, that we still have an active and a vibrant and enthusiastic anticipation for the return of Jesus Christ, because this old man did, and we can as well. And he didn't just take him in his arms. Again, this word took is a beautiful Greek word, dekamaya, which is a little bit of a, a contraction of our previous Greek word, and it means to welcome or to accept with joyful reception. Again, beautiful quote to put in your margin against verse 28. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, where the Apostle Paul says, he says, Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord will give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing that yearn for his appearing. Is that us, brothers and sisters? Got a bit weary, got a bit old, been in the truth a long time. Are we weary? Because this man here was ready to welcome Jesus Christ and he welcomed him in his arms. What will the presence of Jesus Christ mean to you? You can have open arms to reach out and embrace and run towards the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the very essence of what your life has been about the very core element, everything you've looked forward to. We're going to run and embrace, come into his presence with joy. Or are we going to step back and sort of try and merge into the shadows because we're embarrassed about where our life has taken us? For Simeon, it was a wonderful experience to come into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he was never going to see the ministry and the, the events that would be part of Christ's life, but he, he died in anticipation of what Jesus Christ would do. And so in verse 29, he utters this very wonderful prayer. He says, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. I don't want anything else in life. I'm happy to fall asleep. According to thy word, verse 30, because my eyes have seen your salvation. He didn't say, I've just seen the baby. He's seen Thy salvation, your salvation. So again, some very interesting terms uh, as he, he describes this particular event. Thy servant, verse 29, thy word, verse 30, thy salvation, verse 32, for thy people. So there was a focus on God and a realisation that God was involved in this whole circumstance. And he lifts up his, his voice and he gives praise to the Father. In verse 30, he says, my eyes have seen it. My eyes have seen it. 
You know, one of the things when you get old is your eyesight starts to go. Can't really read, we've got to hold our Bible up close, or we've got to hold it back here, because we can't really see. But this man had amazing vision, didn't he, for old age. This is a man whose eyes were not dim, but they were bright and they were sparkling and they were enthusiastic because he had great vision. He just didn't see a baby. He saw Yahweh's salvation. And he's the same calibre as a man who was, who was buried on Mount Nebo. Moses, who many years before stood on Mount Nebo and with amazing eyesight saw three and a half thousand years into the future, saw the tribes of Israel assembled in the kingdom. What vision and what eyesight Moses had, and this man's eyesight was just as good. And in fact, his eyesight was better than all the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees that were milling around the temple. They had no idea who Jesus Christ was. He was a man with very keen eyesight. He could see it and he could touch it. And really the calibre of this man, he, he's on par with men like Abraham. You see, in verse 30, my eyes have seen thy salvation. You want to put John 8, verse 56 in your margin. Because here is the comment from Jesus Christ. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the brilliance of vision that Abraham was, correspondingly, Simeon was able to, to, to encapsulate in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11, 13 says, these all died in faith. faith they, didn't have, they, weren't, they didn't receive the promise but they saw them afar off and they embraced them. It's exactly what Simeon was doing here in this particular event. And again, all the worthies of old, they were able to have keen eyesight, to look beyond the problems of the present to the joy of the future. Genesis 45, Jacob, when he heard about his son, it says, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. I want to go and see him before I die. Not only just to see his son, because he knew God's providence was working through his son for the salvation of his other sons. David's vision bowed himself upon the bed and he blessed Yahweh and he was happy because he saw Solomon sitting upon the throne who was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. David saw beyond Solomon to the greater extension of those promises which were, was to be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what a contrast to the people of Israel. You know, here in Ezekiel chapter 12, it talks about them being a re rebellious house. They've got eyes to see, but they don't see. And they've got ears to hear, but they don't hear. You know what Simeon's name means? Hearing. So not only did he have good hearing, he also had good eyesight, which none of the nation of Israel had. Again, in Isaiah 29, it says, their ears are dull of hearing and they close their eyes. So here's the prophets talking about the very situation in which Simeon was, but he was a remarkable standout because he had amazing hearing and excellency of vision. He saw that as this baby was brought into the temple. So when he looked down at that baby, what did he see? Well, he saw global salvation. That's what he saw. Did you notice that in verse 32? What an amazing statement. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. What an amazing insight this man saw. He just didn't see a baby. He saw this was the man who was going to be the salvation of the world and a light for Gentiles. There was no Jew who would, would make that comment. There, there was an exclusiveness about the Jewish tradition that said we are the people of God and that's where it stops at. Well, Simeon saw beyond that Because you know why he was actually quoting from the prophecy of Isaiah. See there in verse 31, You have prepared before the face of all people a light to light the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Come back to Isaiah chapter 52. Because this is Simeon's depth of knowledge of the word. He wasn't just standing in the, the, the temple courtyard twiddling his thumbs and just making a comment about, well, what a wonderful, wonderful looking child. Simeon had his mind helped and encouraged from the scriptures of truth because he understood these prophecies and the extent of them. So we come to Isaiah 52 and verse 10, and here's what Simeon was really quoting. He says, Yahweh has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see, here it is, the salvation of our God. Yahshua is the name of Jesus. Isaiah 52 and verse 10. 
This is what Simeon was, was understanding. He knew this prophecy. But look back at verse 8. Look at the context of this. So wonderful. Verse 8. Thy watchman shall lift up the voice. Well, who was the watchman? Well, it was Simeon and it was Anna. They were lifting up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. Face to face, says the Hebrew. They saw Messiah face to face. Verse 9 says, Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. Well, who are the waste places of Jerusalem? Well, this was the old Simeon and this old Anna who hung around the temple. A bit annoying, really, these old people. Well, they were described here as the waste places of Jerusalem. But they had an enlivened view and a full understanding of this whole prophecy of, of Isaiah. And they were to sing together as a, a duet almost, their appreciation of the providence of the Father. So when we come to Isaiah 52, it's quite wonderful to overlay some of the statements of Isaiah 52 with the fulfilment, in a sense, part fulfilment, in Luke chapter 2. So we, we can parallel these two layers. Isaiah 52 talks about the watchman lifting up the voice. Well, that happened, of course, in Luke chapter 2. It talks about them breaking forth into joy and eventually finishes up by saying, in the eyes of all nations they will see the Yahshua, the salvation of our God. There is the overlay in Luke chapter 2. But Simeon, you know, this is quite wonderful. Simeon had an amazing understanding of the prophecy of Isaiah because Isaiah, uh, both in chapter 42, chapter 49, 52 and 60, talks about salvation going out to the Gentiles. This is the essence of the prophecy of Isaiah that Simeon was familiar with. Mine eyes have seen, behold my servant, king shall see, thy watchman shall see, lift up thine eyes. So this, this parallel about eyesight and seeing. Uh, it's talking about the salvation of God. It's talking about a salvation which went out to all people, to the Gentiles. And of course it, it finishes up the glory of the people of Israel. So when you overlay Isaiah 42, 49, 52 and 60, you can see that amazing thread of which Simeon was absolutely familiar with. So when the Messiah, as a babe, came into the temple. He said, here is the salvation of God for the Gentiles. And he is lifting that out of Isaiah. Well, some remarkable words when we come back to Luke chapter 2. Because one of the things about old age as well is, well, old people tell it how it is. You know, sometimes they're pretty blunt. Uh, and sometimes we can be confronted by what, what they're saying. But often it's because they have a bigger perspective than us. We're just seeing in our little life... Uh, this far and of course they've had years of experience so they can see a broader aspect of life and they say it as it is well Simeon was very like that in, in Luke chapter 2 because you can imagine when Mary was holding that child she gave it to Simeon and he pronounced his blessing well it wasn't very happy news was it because in verse 34 he says this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel a sign which shall be spoken against and a sword will pierce your heart also well that wasn't very comforting for Mary what did this man mean? Destined for the fall. It means the collapse, the ruin, the disappointment. So this man understood what would happen to our Lord Jesus Christ, crucifixion and death. Many would put their hope and trust in him that he was the political leader that would, would save them from the Romans. And they were disappointed in Jesus Christ when he was crucified. Simeon knew that, he understood that because he understood the whole process of the atonement and the death and the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But you notice as well he says, and for the rising again, verse 34, rising again, Greek word anastasis, which means a standing up, which interestingly in 42 times, in fact in all the other times this Greek word is used, anastasis, it is always translated resurrection. So Simeon is saying, yes, many will be disappointed, but in the end, there will be many who will be encouraged by the resurrection, the anesthesis of this man. And that's his hope. That was what Simeon was looking forward to, a resurrection and a standing again. So for Simeon, it was a very wonderful, wonderful thing, experience for him to see the salvation of God. But did you notice the words that he said to Mary in verse 35? As he looked at Mary, young woman, overawed by the honour and the privilege to bring up the Son of God. I mean, how daunting would that be? And he says to her, a sword will pierce thy soul also. So there's the word also. 
So it implies that the heart or the, or the body of the Lord Jesus Christ would be pierced as well, which we know it was on the cross, wasn't it? His body was pierced. But hers was going to be as well in the sense of the distress of seeing that and, of course, in her own life of trying to educate and bring up a family in the context of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not just talking about the crucifixion. He's talking about the whole life of Mary. In fact, it was the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 10 and verse 34 that says, I've not just come to bring peace on the earth. I've come to bring a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against the mother. Person's enemies will be those of their own household. And you can imagine as the Lord Jesus Christ growing up with his brothers and Mary there, there was a difficulty. There was an anguish that Mary experienced in her life. But the words of Simeon were wise, weren't they? Because they helped Mary to prepare for a time of anguish and agony, which he knew was ahead of her. So here she is holding this new baby, all excited, and Simeon gives her some words of wisdom. Well, there was another lovely lady in the temple as well, uh, Anna. She had the problem of old age too. But you wouldn't know it because... Her life story is hidden in just three verses here in verse 36, 37 and 38. Sprightly service and a consistency of commitment. Uh, verse 36 talks about her, some of the events in, in her life. It says, There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Interesting detail. She was of great age and lived with her husband seven years from her virginity and she was a widow for 84 years. So, you see, she's a widow for 84 years. She'd been married for seven. So we're looking at a, a lady who's probably in her hundreds. She's probably around about 100 or a little bit over 100 years of age. 84 years since her husband died. She was only married for seven years. We don't know why he died, but she's just married for seven years. Her husband dies. Could have been bitter about life. Could have questioned God. Could have been some resentment there. Why would God? I mean, she'd only been married for seven years and she was a lovely woman. Why would God uh, create this trauma? She could have lived a life of bitterness. How do these events affect us, brothers and sisters, when we have trauma in our lives? Do they devastate our faith? Do they destroy our loyalty? Do we decide, do, do we decide to no longer walk with God? Well, I think we can draw from the example of this amazing sister, the encouragement that she provided. She didn't lose her faith and trust in God. She didn't walk away from him. She didn't question God. She accepted those circumstances of life and she gave another 84 years of service in the temple, waiting, waiting, waiting for the redemption and for the joy of a baby that she could never have. Messiah. She never had a family. She lost her husband after seven years of marriage. Imagine the joy she would have of holding this baby in her hands. Well, it says in verse 36, she was uh, the daughter of Phanuel. Phanuel means the face of Ale, face of God. And I guess it de describes in a way of how, how people visualised her. You know, bright-eyed, happy, glowing, old age, no excuse. Remember Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, called the place Penuel, which is the same Hebrew word, he said, because I've seen God face to face. And she was of the tribe of Asher. What do we know about Asher? Asher means happy. And she was the only member of the tribe who ever made any biblical contribution. There's no other historical events about people in Asher, except for this one here, Anna. She came from the least important tribe of the nation. Well, where did Asher come from? Well, you remember that Jacob had a wife, Leah, who he didn't really love, wasn't his first choice. And she had a handmaid called Zilpah, and Asher was born from the handmaid of an unloved wife. So, I mean, you couldn't get much lower than this. She was of the, 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 the lowest of the lowest tribes, Asher. But at the age of possibly a hundred plus, every single day she would come to the temple. You can imagine people say to her, hey Anna, you know what? 
just go on the Sabbath. You don't have to go every single day. You know, take it easy, you're getting old. And I can imagine Anna saying, no, I want to be in the temple when the Lord comes, when I, I want to see the Lord's Christ. And you know the journey every day was quite extensive. Here we are, we went in 2011 to Israel and we're just sitting here in this little section. The uh, beautiful gate is up here and these are the steps going up to the, the temple area. There's 30 steps here in pairs of 15, they're, they're different dimensions, so that as you walk up these steps, you've actually got to look down, because otherwise you'll trip over. So in a sense, it physically made you bow as you ascended to the temple. So there's 30 steps here, another 15 steps to go into the, to the area of the women in the temple area. And of course, this is an artist's reconstruction of what it would like, be like in the time of Anna. So have a look at those steps here. We were just in this particular area there. So, you know, there's, there, there's some physical uh, difficulties in going to the temple every single day. But for Anna, 100 years plus, she wanted to be there when Messiah came into the temple. So, of course, this is particularly Robinson's arch. A little bit further on is Wilson's arch. So the question is, brothers and sisters, do we ever get tired in the truth? You've been in the truth for 10 years? Thought Jesus would return a little bit quicker? Maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60? Fatigued, drained? I think the burden of old age is almost a contradiction when you look at the lovely, energetic example of Anna whose face just shone every single day because she was anticipating salvation. And look at verse 37. It says, She departed not from the temple. She departed not from the temple. There was an absolute commitment year after year, day and night. She stopped in the temple for a long, long period of time. She made the house of God her home. She knew the Messiah was coming and she said to people, I just want to be in God's house when he comes. So what about us, brothers and sisters? You know, is, is God's house our home? Is that where we want to be? Or do we grudgingly go along on Sunday because, well, it's pretty inconvenient for our weekend, but we'll do it. Is the house of God our home? Are we happy? Are we anticipating? Because this sister, I think, can give us some wonderful pointers. Because these are the people who will receive the reward from the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 7 and verse 14 and 15 says, These are they which have come out of great tribulation. Do you think Anna had tribulation in her life? I think yes. I think she had some difficult circumstances and traumas that she had to deal with, but she still loved God and gave faithful service consistently. These are those that have come out of great tribulation. They washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night. You know, that's the phrase that's drawn right here, isn't it? The end of verse 37. Serve God with fasting and prayers night and day. There's the exact parallel. There's a reward in Revelation chapter 7. And there's a beautiful uh, reference in 1 Chronicles 9, verse 33, about the singers in the temple, which was very much the essence of Anna. She was joyful as people would come into the temple. She would speak about the Messiah and the hope of salvation that she had. Here in 1 Chronicles 9, verse 33, it talks about the singers who were on duty day and night. That's the point. And the Apostle Paul, I think, uses her example as a definition of true widowhood. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 5, he says, You want a definition of a widow? A spiritually minded widow is a person who trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. That's Anna. That's the definition of a lovely person who is serving God consistently through her old age. And verse 37 talks about her prayers. What would Anna be praying for, do you think? Her career? family, her assets, youthful health. She didn't have any of that. She didn't have any of those things. But she was verbalising in her prayers the joy of seeing the Messiah. In her marriage, she may not have had the joy of a family. She may not have had the blessings of any children. But she held a son in her hands who was not just a son, it was the Son of God. She held him in her hands and that would have gladdened her heart. It was such a joyful thing. She just couldn't stop talking about him to everyone that came into the temple area. 
And we can imagine Anna there with an open and a happy face, with sparkling eyesight, with a joy that was unquenchable, just speaking about her love of the Lord's Christ, the Messiah who is going to bring salvation to Israel and to the Gentiles. Verse 38 says, she coming in that instant. Well, it's not really right in the King James Version. The emphasis should be on her instant prayer. Diaglot says she standing by at that very time praised God. As soon as she heard Simeon give his prophecy about this baby, she too instantly praised God. Isn't that a wonderful expression? You know, when something happy and something good happens to us in life, do we instantly go into prayer? Because that's what we should be doing. Romans chapter 12 talks about, and again, this is the re-essence of the character of Anna. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, that's Anna. Serving the Lord, that's Anna. Rejoicing in hope, that's Anna. Patient in tribulation, that's Anna. Continuing instant in prayer, that's Anna. What a wonderful definition. What a wonderful compression of the character of this amazing old woman who had a vibrancy and a wonderful example, I think, that, that we can admire. She coming in that instant. Sometimes we feel tired, we feel exhausted, we feel worn out. I think this old couple can encourage us to lift up the hands that hang down, brothers and sisters, and the knees which sometimes feel a little bit feeble. There's a need for us to have our older brothers and sisters and to be thankful for their counsel and their guidance and their consistent joyfulness in the truth. We need to reach out and touch them and embrace them and connect to them because they are living examples to us of a faithfulness of a service. And, you know, when we do reach out and we touch them, we're reaching out and touching Jesus Christ because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who says, inasmuch as you've done this to others, you've done it to me. So there is consolation in reaching out for Christ. It will give us peace of mind. It will give us a joyful heart. Simeon and Anna, an old couple who reached out for Christ with open arms because they were waiting for the consolation of Israel. They were serving God with prayers and they were looking for redemption. Waiting, serving and looking. These are the activities of fellowship that give us consolation for the problem of old age.